Yeah, I'm Edgar Bro. Uh, I'm the uh, leader and the founder of uh, Simply Saucer. And um, let's leave it at that. Okay, sounds good. Um, okay, so before we get to Bob, uh, the reason why you're here is because of Simply Saucer and your uh, affiliation with Bob. So tell me a little bit about Simply Saucer. Okay, Simply Saucer are a, a Hamilton, Ontario based band that was formed in 1973. Um, all of us were avid record collectors. We met at a downtown uh, Hamilton record store called Bob Moody's. Uh, we were collecting uh, cult artists like uh, Sun Ra, uh, German bands like Can and, and Faust, um, the Stooges, early Pink Floyd, Soft Machine. Mm -hmm. And uh, we began uh, rehearsing on a, in a storefront on uh, Kenilworth Street where I was living at the time. And... Uh, it was through our manager, Rick Bissell, that we, uh, we first met Bob Lanois. Okay. All right. I will say, uh, I spent some time listening to Cyborgs Revisited, uh -huh. and it reminded me of every single tattoo studio I've ever been in, because they always play this loud punk rock music, <laughs> <laughs> always distorted, yeah. and I put it on, and I'm like, yeah, this feels like every tattoo I've ever received. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's the first time I heard that. Though. That's funny. <laughs> okay, so I'll, uh, you probably uh, have read this quote. I'm going to uh, read you a quote that Bob said about his time with Simply Saucer. <laughs> Basically, they could barely play. That's the main thing I could remember. They could barely get to the studio on time, barely get their instruments in tune, and barely play their own songs. I knew how to deal with people, even at my tender age, and I whipped them into shape. The main thing I was dealing with was that they weren't taking the session seriously, but because of the kind of person I guess I might have been back then, I was able to work through that. I thought, hey man, these kids got something, and I'm going to whip their asses. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very funny quote. <laughs> it is. Um, and the funny thing about his, the, the phrase, I'm going to whip their asses, everyone that I've talked to that has worked with Bob said that that's exactly what he does. Yeah, my, my memory is Bob was very serious, a yeah. very serious guy uh, in the studio. We were cocky, we were, we were green, mm -hmm. but uh, the sound that we uh, brought to uh, Master Sound Studio, I would say it was fully realized. It was what we wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually uh, were obsessive uh, in terms of rehearsals and that. Yeah. Um, I, I, we, our influences may be, uh, Bob wasn't that familiar with them. Right. Um, we, we asked him his favorite producer and he said, Bill, uh, Simzik, uh, the, the Eagles producer. And we, we were kind of horrified. We thought, how's this guy going to get our sound? Yeah. <laughs> and so I brought White Light, White Heat, the Velvet Underground album and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, the Stooges Raw Power. We gave him that. And, uh. You know, Do Bob just took it uh, nonplussed. He just uh, set everything up and uh, recorded this raw, live off the floor. He did a fantastic job. Good. And, uh, that actually brings me to, uh, to the next question. So it's the early 1970s, and you've recorded in Daniel and Bob Lanois' basement recording studio. Um, so tell me what you remember about that experience of recording with them in the basement studio that they built. Yeah, I just remember uh, a very a serious session. Uh, Dan was in and out, uh, and all the other times I, I remember him cupping his hands over his head. I don't know if he's shocked, <laughs> disgusted, or <laughs> or what. But uh, it was mainly Bob's thing, mm -hmm. and uh, from there, uh, the uh, our manager took it to around all the major uh, labels in Canada. It was recorded as a demo, right. and uh, we got turned down, and. Um, about a year later, our manager left, took the tapes with him. Uh, he moved back to Montreal, and they were at the bottom of a closet, and he was in uh, Arabia working uh, for Northern Telecom, mm -hmm. and they, they sat there for about 15 years. Wow, yeah. crazy. Um, so you knew Bob Lanois in, throughout the in the 1970s. Um, so to, uh, from what you recall, tell me about Bob Lanois in the 1970s. Yeah, like Bob, that was really my only uh, brush with Bob mm -hmm. and, until uh, 1987 yep. when he became involved again uh, with uh, what eventually became Cyborgs Revisited. Because mm -hmm. um, Bruce Mowat went with the, uh, the tapes to Bob asking him to transfer them into digital mm -hmm. because I had eventually uh, obtained the, ta the tapes again yep. uh, from Rick Purcell. 
And uh, so Bob had a place on Barton Street, I think it was called The Lab, and uh, Bob uh, did the transfer, the digital transfer, and Bruce sent the tapes uh, to some American uh, record companies and uh, trend-setting kind of people. Mm -hmm. um, Forced Exposure was one of them, and, and they said, yeah, it's great, put it out. Do you have any more material? And all I had really was a, uh, a Jackson Square concert that we, we had performed uh, at in 1975. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was done real, on a reel-to-reel, -reel, a Tanberg uh, tape recorder, uh, straight from uh, the vocal mics. Uh, there were two mics, actually. Mm -hmm. It was like the, the pencil Shure, and it was right into the tape recorder. So the, the vocal was very loud and the music was in the background. We weren't sure we could use it, but Bob, uh, I don't know how he did it. He worked his magic and uh, he brought all the music forward and he got us a great sound and eventually it was released uh, as Cyborgs Revisited in uh, I think around 1988, 89. So, okay, so that's a good, that's a good, that's a good point. So Cyborgs Revisited basically is, is it mainly that Jackson Square? Uh, the six studio songs yeah, that we did okay. with Bob in 1974, right? And then the Jackson Square, uh, yeah. three songs from the Jackson Square concert. But the entire Jackson Square uh, uh, music has, along with the studio stuff, has yeah. been re-released as a double album right. by a California label called In the Red. Okay. And that's gone, you know, to Europe and uh, right. And all he, over, all over so the like States. you said, he basically took music from two microphones, <laughs> and and. Fixed it, however he did, yeah. into something presentable that he did, yeah. And uh, the the uh, the the reviews were amazing, like the critical yeah kind of stuff started immediately. Um. So so you actually just um, answered the next question, which was you told me the story about the tapes from the show on the roof of Jackson Square, and that he was able to salvage the old recordings. So you've already told me that story, which is great. Um, so you said, um, tell me about Cyborgs Revisited and how it landed on the top 100 Canadian albums. Yeah, well, it was fanzines. Like, they were major fanzines that started writing about them. Mm -hmm. And then the minor fanzines who read the majors, you know, fanzines like FUD, which was uh, Chris Stigliano. And um, as I said, uh, uh, what's the... Uh, Forced exposure, mm -hmm. and, and it, it was just hundreds of fan scenes and uh, music fans. A lot of it was like the the bands and the artists that we were influenced. By then, they had become part of the rock canon, mm -hmm. and so they were no longer obscure bands. Everybody was into them, so we were just uh, by the, the wheel of fortune, or Lady Fortuna. Mm -hmm. um, it made our uh, our record something that intrigued people because. Uh, people had plumbed all the delete bins. They'd gone on to all the obscure uh, records mm -hmm. uh, by American and um, English uh, artists. And right. uh, so people were quite surprised that uh, this obscure Hamilton band that had never released a record, except She's a Dog, yeah. our, our 45, yeah. uh, had made these recordings. I mean, when we were playing in the Toronto punk scene in 1978-79, uh, I don't... We weren't doing a lot of that material, and right. I don't think anybody was really aware of it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that had seen us in those early days. So. Excellent. Uh, so you said. Um, uh, so I have three more questions. So you have you have sort of kept up with Bob over the years. So you have been here. Was it recording or just visiting? No. Uh, when Bob put out uh, Snake Road, uh, I, I put out a record called Canadian Primitive. Uh, a year or two later, and uh, Bruce Mowat thought it would be fun if the two of us uh, got together again and, and did some touring. Okay. So uh, we played in uh, Montreal and uh, uh, Gatineau, Quebec, and uh, we played the Black Sheep Inn and uh, Toronto and mm -hmm. Kitchener. And cool. So, so what was, was your uh, what was your experience like? Uh, Hanging out here with Bob, what did you guys just have a meeting? Or? Yeah, we could, yeah we had a meeting and talked about the tour, what we wanted to do and mm -hmm. what we wanted to accomplish. And uh, I did some playing, and Bob did some singing, and uh, yeah, it was. Uh, so how was it touring with him? It was great. Uh, yeah, he was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then uh, he was great on stage, a real showman. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, we got on quite well. Mm -hmm. So if you can tell me, what is uh, Bob Lanois' lasting impression on you as an artist and musician? 
he was uh, an original guy, one of a kind, creator, innovator, and uh, who had locked down uh, the technical side of things. He, he was really fantastic in that area. Good. And uh, lastly, what do you believe to be uh, Bob's legacy as it relates to music? Uh, well, he's recorded and uh, produced so many artists, and, uh, and uh, he'll be remembered as a filmmaker, producer, uh, excellent musician in his own right, and uh, someone who gave to the community. And, uh, yeah, he'll be always remembered for that. Shit show, and I'm feeling kind of dead inside. 